All right, everybody, welcome back to Inside the Jackal's Head right here on PSN Radio. Without any further delay, we're live with our guest, Mr. William J. Hall, the author of the book, The World's Most Haunted House. William, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to to finally get to connect with you. I've been going through the book, like I said, but before we get to the book, I want to actually start up uh, with your background a little bit because uh, I was fascinated to find out that you're you're a magician. Yes, yes. <laughs> tell, tell us about that. How did you get involved in magic? What sparked your interest in magic? Well, uh, well, I was seven when I started doing magic. Uh, my sister used to play accordion and... Um, uh, my dad uh, used to get stuck going down there for her to do recitals and whatnot, and they ended up having a magician for uh, uh, for people like me, the children who didn't want to sit through this recital. And and I saw a magician and told my dad that's what I want to do, and that's that's how it started. <laughs> um, so I, you know, and I always was a curious kind of uh, child, so it really uh, I, I just. Held on. It was just one of those things, you know, you pick up so many things when you're a child, but it's one of those things that has always stayed with me uh, to this day. So, I've always been fascinated by magicians. I, in fact, I'm a good friend or had a, a good friend of years ago who was actually a magician in Vegas now, uh, David Darkstone. Shout outs to him. Oh, I, haven't seen him. I haven't seen him in a few years because he's been out of Vegas, you know, living it up. Uh, but the, the whole world of, the, of, you know, magic, it's such a, a cool thing to, you know, be a part of. Uh, you, you pursued that for a while. I mean, what made you stop pursuing it and get into more into writing? Well, uh, there was a time I was doing a few hundred shows uh, a year. And, uh, and that would make anybody want to stop right there. That's a lot of shows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, it was a lot of fun and it, it put a lot of food on my table and, uh, it really happened when, uh, uh, with the kids, you know, when I had, uh, um, children and the boys, it, it became, uh, once I was able to afford it as, you know, my career took off, I ended up, uh, just doing magic for fun because, uh, otherwise I'd never be around, you know, cause shows are, you're always working when people are having fun, you know, you're working right. on the weekends and, mm -hmm. and holidays and, you know, things like that. So, Tell me about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's <laughs> so that's really what uh, uh, you know. Once you're making enough money, uh, you know, then uh, I didn't need to do the shows, and then I would just do them for uh, you know the work, uh, Christmas party or special occasions, and my own children, you know, things like that, friends and 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 whatnot. So um, that's really what uh, you know what made me. Uh, uh, get out of it, but I did it for many years uh, that way. So, uh, you know what always uh, amazed me about you know being around magicians because uh, I hung around uh, you know a few of them over ten years ago, and just being around them, you know, seeing the way that the tricks are done kind of like ruined it for me because you know I've always had that illusion you know how did they do it you know but actually finding out was kind of like, you know messed up for me uh, but you're like you said you're working when everybody else is enjoying it uh, do you see magicians now and do you still get you know, awe inspired when you see them doing the tricks or do you're like are you cynical when you're like ah, I know how he did that or how they did that uh, do you have you become that guy uh, <laughs> uh, yeah no that's a good question uh, I you know you could always uh, be entertained and always uh, and, and always be fooled. Even if you think about it, and you're like, "Oh yeah, I know." There's only you know, one way to, you know, even uh, even if you if you say, "Okay, I I know how it's done," it could, you can still see the wonder in the moment. Uh, but you know, at, at times it, it could be tough. But uh, uh, but we're all. I mean, Houdini was fooled constantly by people he knew. You know, at the Magic Club, just like Copperfield, and you know, nobody knows everything and. And it is amazing how, uh, unlike technological advancements, uh, advancements in magic normally has to do with um, uh, creative thinking. Right. You know, that's it's yep. that's really how it advances for the most part. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so so that's fascinating because uh, you see something new, and as somebody's used maybe a, a principle that existed in the eighteen hundreds, but they found a really neat different use for it or something. So there's a lot of uh, creative thinking is really what advances it, unlike other things like technology or things like right. that. Um, that uh, it, it really is just, you know, the mind coming up with, uh, you know, a new way to either combine things that exist or come up with a slightly 
uh, you know, new spin on a principle or, or something like that. So that's an interesting part of it is uh, uh, there's just a lot of amazing thinkers out there. There is, and and magic has gotten really mainstream also in the last 15 years with uh, Chris Angel and, you know, people like him who have really made it mainstream almost. Yeah, yeah, and and there's, I've been lucky in my lifetime, I guess, I guess, I guess before me too it existed, but you know you had Doug Henning, yeah, uh, you know in the seventy, you know David Copperfield through the eighties, and well, well of course he's still performing, and uh, so you know when you have uh, somebody in the limelight like that, it uh, it really does help, uh, you know help the art, but um, but yeah, it's it's you know one of those universal uh, languages, and I think uh, the interesting part about magic for me is. It really has given me a kind of a different way to think about things. You know, give you a real quick example. You know, mm. we talk about possession, um, regardless of what you believe about it, but uh, people would interpret that as something evil entering into somebody and holding them captive. Right. So you know, so we when we judge things, we we do it by. Uh, we look at ourselves as the center of the universe. You know, it's they're invading us, and right. and then we also look at it from a very obvious kind of perspective, surface level. You know, we would never think, huh? You know, maybe uh, some entity that may or may not be completely evil. You know, and maybe in a bad, maybe well, maybe we're seeing them at their worst, or you know, whatever the case is. And I'm not saying that. Maybe they're just having a bad day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm not. I'm not saying that's what it is, but I'm just using this as an example. Right. right. Uh, you know, we never think, oh, maybe they're trapped in the body, and maybe they want to get out as oh. bad as bad as you want a, them out. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good theory. Uh, well, it, you know, and again, this I don't have any strong belief that uh, uh, that that's what it is, but I'm using it as an example that. Uh, we we think very uh, linear and very, um, you know. But I don't want to say simple. You know, it's, it's not simplistic, so, but it's you know our, we we gen we see things uh, from the most obvious angle. You know, we we well, just like if somebody's in front front of you, if somebody's being rude to you, the first thing you think of yourself is, you know, what a jerk that person, right. a jerk. You, you don't yeah. you don't think you know. May, Maybe something horrifying happened to them in their life. They're probably not a jerk all the time, but we don't think right. that way, right? I mean, we just saw oh, they're a jerk, you know. <laughs> oh, I have a great story of, uh, of just that, my friend. Let me tell you, I went to Comic Con a few years ago, and I, I had a run-in with Lou Ferrigno, you know, the Incredible Hulk. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> now a lot of people say he's one of the nicest guys in the world. He's super sweet and gentle. He almost killed me because I asked him if he would be on camera and, and he was really just having, I guess, a bad day and we had a bad, alterca bad altercation. And then I told one of my buddies who knows Lou Ferrigno and I was like, man, what a jerk. He like, literally, he got up and he was like all upset and we almost got into it and, and he was like, really, Lou did that? Because Lou's like one of the nicest guys I know. And and I, I just caught him on a bad day. But to me, I'm going to have that imprinted now in my mind that he's just a jerk. Right, right. You know? And, you know, but that's the way we think. It's it's just really uh, you know it's natural. It's I'm I'm not saying that we're all wrong for it. It's just a, right. a natural way of thinking. And I think when we think about you know when we're talking about the paranormal, there uh, there's so much that's unknown um, that I'm not fond when people get extremely specific mm. uh, with exact things that are going on. You know that this thing is you know ultimately evil or this thing you know i mean we really don't i mean we don't know we can say something's negative or you felt you know right. ob obviously there are feelings where you know you definitely feel you know something's extremely negative so well but let me let me ask you also uh william uh for example say a person has seen an entity appear or there, there's an apparition or something even though the apparition is peaceful and not doing anything uh human nature is to get scared at something different and weird and and not uh, of nor of the normal, so the human beings are, might react negatively, and we might be the ones that are negative, and not the apparition or the spirit itself. Oh yes, um, and of course we see that all the time, right? I mean, it really depends on, uh, you know, one family could be in a house, and you know, you'd never have anything horrible happen. You put a different family in that house, and it it would be chaos with mm. uh, 
you know, you know, because they would just attract that. Uh, yeah. Um, or at least, you know, appear to attract. Again, we don't understand all the mechanics of it, but we certainly, you know, we can't help but make some of those correlations and, and you know, judgments. Um, but, you know, a, a real neat example is, you know, in the Lindley Street haunting, uh, there was three guys tried to burn the house down while the family was inside the house. Now, mm. if you were an entity and you saw that, what would you think of us as a species? You know, I mean, would you, wouldn't you think that we're a hundred percent evil or, you know, but those, those three guys weren't evil. They were stupid. They were scared, but they weren't evil. So, you know, our determinations when we judge these, uh, entities, uh, whether good, bad, neutral, because of course there's all different types, um, were very, you know, polar in our views and, uh, and very one dimensional. And, you know, we as humans aren't very one dimensional. I mean, even serial killers technically aren't evil. They're mentally ill, you know? Oh so, yeah. No, Jeffrey Dahmer, everybody said was the nicest guy in the world and he ate people for a living. You know, if yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there's you know, there's a screw loose. I'm not saying no, of course, I, yeah. yeah, I'm not saying let them go run around, but I mean, uh, but so even they're not 100 percent evil. So we judge these things, you know, we're very, uh, we just judge them by what we see, which is of course not very much. Just like right. an example of you know somebody being a jerk on a particular, acting like a jerk, but they may not be a jerk themselves, you know, so. Um, now, when we're talking about the book, though, uh, you know, the world's most haunted house, you're talking about a poltergeist on Lindsley Street. Uh, you know, the, obviously, when you hear the word poltergeist, I think of the movie Poltergeist, and I, uh, by the way, one of my favorite movies of all times. Yeah. How true is that compared to what you researched and what we got in the book here? How true is that movie, for example? Um, it, you know, that that's a, Poltergeist, the movie is very extreme. Um, you know, way over the that's, top. That's another statement, over, actually. Yeah, yeah, way, way over the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say way over the top. Um, uh, whereas, you know, these these parasites, as I would call them, are generally, you know, a bit cowardly. And uh, Are they more like a nuisance than really a threatening force? Uh, no, they, they could be a real, real, real threat. Um, okay. And they also could be, you know, nuisance. It's really, you know, to me, it's really... Uh, yeah, you know, a few people got banged around, but uh, for the most part, it's the psychological toll that offers the biggest, uh, you know, uh, threat to you, you know, or, right. or life threat is is if you, you know, walk out of it never, you know, never again the same, and, you know, just like any uh, almost trauma, really. So, and for some people, you know, they would be perfectly fine. And, you know, other people, it, it could mar them for life. And, uh, and you know, I, I saw that in, you know, in this, in this Lindley Street case. I mean, there were uh, police officers that were like, oh, that was interesting. And, you know, retired police officer Joe Tomic, who, who was talked to me numerous times and, and was intrigued by it, uh, you know, knows it was real. And uh, it didn't, you know, it didn't harm him at all. You know, he he was uh, fascinated by it. He told me there wasn't a day that goes by he doesn't think about it. Um, you know, definitely changed his life from a you know a viewpoint. You know, right, un understanding right. this stuff's out there and whatnot. But it didn't interfere with his life in any way. You know, and uh, whereas you know, there's some others. Uh, there's one witness that ended up being you know really bad alcoholic as a result. You know, so when we when we look at are these things dangerous. You know, if you're looking for, you know, steal your soul or something like in the movies, then I then I would say, well, no, you don't really have to worry about to that degree. But, you know, psychologically is where uh, you get torn apart or you could get torn apart. And that depends on the person, you know. Well, also, I mean, depending on the person as well, you just, you know, you're describing a person who's an alcoholic. How much does the alcohol abuse uh, play into the actual encounter? Uh, I mean, it could all be a hallucination and then. You know how the human mind likes to embellish on events that they believe happened. Oh yeah, no, I'm talking. You know, turn turning to it afterwards where you don't have a history. Of oh well, that's a different story. Yeah, 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 no, that's what I'm <laughs> that's talking different. about. It, it certainly can heighten an already existing problem, but right. you know, yeah, and and then you know some other witnesses I talked to, uh, uh, 
most of them not the case. But, you know, uh, one witness I talked to said, well, no, I, I don't really think about it too much, actually. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> I mean, people are, you know, it's uh, it's all different. To some it was, uh, you know, wondrous and, and life-changing, and they think about it. Um, to some it's, uh, you know, one officer uh, won't even talk about it, not even no, that, to, to his brother. The house is still there, to. right? Yes, it is, yeah. Um, there's only been one owner since the Goodens, and it was uh, it was a, the fam- the f- children bought it for a little old Portuguese woman. She doesn't know, you know, the history of the house or anything. Uh, she wondered why people were taking pictures of it. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody tried to tell her? Uh, man, well, I, seen t- anything I, or told asked her? <laughs> I told the neighbor so that because uh, he didn't know either, so he can explain it to her. Because you know, I certainly would love to go in the house too. Um, but, uh, you know, so he was going to tell her cause she keeps thinking people want to break into her house, you know, uh. <laughs> and then he goes, and then he goes to me, well, you know, just, uh, just the other week there was some guy walking around the property. You know, I, I didn't want to tell him that was me, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know like, oh God, you know, so now, you know, we, I, everyone thought it was unoccupied cause it had a, a, a rusty chain on the front uh, gate. But uh, he goes, oh, no, she only used the back door. So, I mean, you know, I would never be walking around there if I thought somebody was in there. It just looked like it was unoccupied. But uh, but it is occupied. But, you know, that's a good example. There's ne- never was a history of anything before or after. Um, and I believe that it probably never would have happened at all if you had a different family. But this is a very dysfunctional, typical kind of poltergeist set up. There's a lot of dysfunction, you know, going on in, in that family. And the house itself was kind of, you know, the poster child for uh, the paranormal waiting to happen. You know, you had the underground spring and, and there was a lot of power lines and high water tables and sandy soils. A lot of those electromagnetic um, conductors, if, if you will, that, uh, you know, that we see in a lot of these things. So I think just a lot of that um, made it where it just needed that other ingredient, which was, you know, the trauma going on in the family and kind of the typical teen, preteen uh, girl usually, and it was in this case, Marcia, um, you know, that led to this uh, you know, paranormal ex- explosion. Because it, it was really, uh, it, it, there was a few days where it was at its, absolute height it, it was very bad to the point where you had policemen in every room and they all were experiencing things and that that doesn't happen too much it's usually you go you walk in and you know things have to settle down before you'd ever see anything you know um so it was very uh, intense at that point now why is it that it seems that a lot of these poltergeist uh, activities are tied into preteens? I mean, it, is there? Uh, what do you think that is? Is it a hormonal thing? Well, you know, and and because I've actually heard this before many times. Yes, and, yes, and, and in these cases, and uh, and and it certainly could be tied to that. Uh, the other the other part makes me think that. Um, and I, and I guess this does mean hormone, but because of what you're going through at that age and then add to it some sort of trauma or drama, which, I mean, most children... Puberty, age, that's, that's drama. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> I, know, I know. We'd all have poltergeists if that's all there was to it, but given the <laughs> last ingredient, um, I, you know, I, I think that these, uh, these parasites uh, find them as a target or a... It might be better said, almost like a um, a team, you know, almost like a negative. They have it appears they have this negative relationship, uh, the entity and and you know the the young girl or entity and entities, uh, almost like they're each getting something out of it. Um, you know, for maybe the girl, it's it's being able to express things that are all bottled up through. Uh, you know, this explosion of activity and energy or whatever. Um, and again, this is just a theory. Again, I'm doing right, right. what we talked about earlier. I'm drawing speculating. Yeah, but I, I mean, yeah, but, exactly. but honestly, I mean, it, it, it is funny that on a lot of these cases, it is dealing with a preteen or a teenage girl involved. Uh, you know, a lot of that could be a manifestation of the girl herself. 
uh, and maybe not even be anything spiritual or poltergeist uh, related. Oh, you mean like uh, psychokinesis? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and I mean that's that's a theory that uh, you know the psychokinesis is what. Uh, opens the portal, if you will, so that ah. you know, so there's some cases where there's entities involved, and there's other cases uh, where they're not. Um, you know, I'm open to the possibility of that. I, I'm not really sure if uh, that's it, or if it's um, you, you know the that there is a quote unquote you know portal there already. Right. You know, and it's hard to tell. It's kind of a chicken or an egg kind of question. But we do right. we do know in any event, regardless of what you know theory that that um, that you think is the best. You know, we do know that the preteen or teenage girl or boy involved in these kinds of things is definitely you know the focal point of this and has that some sort of relationship with what's going on. Obviously, so. Um, and then what caused it is, uh, you know, that's what becomes tough. You know, is it the psychokinesis opening the portal, or is the portal already there and it's an interaction of energy somehow, which of course could be psychokinesis also. But is there a portal uh, at all? Or I mean, the, the right, manifestations, yeah. yeah, manifestations can happen in numeral number of different ways. In exactly. fact, uh, yeah, Bill, you know, funny enough, uh, you know, I do a UFO related show also on on uh, on this network. It's on Wednesday nights, actually, and uh, we know we're just about ufology, and yeah. and what we discuss is all UFO based. And one of the theories that I've had for a long time, especially since I've been doing this show for about seven years now, uh, one of my main theories that I've been talking about over and over again is how throughout history, a lot of the uh, the lore and the, and the mythology that we have, like leprechauns, demons, spirits, poltergeists, all these different mythologies, uh, could have been alien contact misidentified because they didn't know the term alien or extraterrestrial back then. In. Do you think that might play a part at all in this? Uh, you know, Art Bell used to talk about the veil dropping soon, and then there, there was this drop of the veil between the dimensions. And could that be a part of what's going on here? Well, I think uh, all of this phenomena is definitely related by um, how it how it comes to us, or how or I should shouldn't say it comes to us, how we're able to view it. Probably is a better way to say it because it's already around. Um, and that's why we find that I believe when I was at a UFO convention, I believe the statistic was like 83% of the time there's UFO, there's also haunted houses and blah, 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 you know, so we, we see that these things are, right. uh, you know, they're very, uh, related, not necessarily to one, one another, but either they're mm -hmm. either the way we're able to view them or the mode of travel, um, uh, you know, that there is that commonality and, you know, great example, like, you know, what you just said about misidentified, uh, when something happens inside a house, we tend to think more, uh, paranormal, um, you know, ghost spirit. If it happens outside, we tend to think UFO. So it is hard to identify, right. you know, what belongs to what, I mean, sometimes you could because of the other you know, indicators or similarities or implants or, you know, whatever, mm, you know, right, some right. makes it obvious, but some, no, but that's a, that's a great point because you don't, you rarely ever hear somebody say, Oh, there was a haunting in a, in a park somewhere. And it was, you know, it was outside. Like you never right. hear that. You never hear that. <laughs> right. Right. You know, they might say they saw a spirit out there, but you know, and the same thing with, Oh, you know, there was a, uh, I saw this weird, you know, orb with my, orb, right. with, with yeah. my naked eye. And it was uh, probably something belonging to an alien. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody would. They wouldn't assume it because it's not outside. So it's got to be outside if it's an alien. Yeah, it's just you know kind of the, the way we think and classify things. Um, uh, and and yeah, it is a, tough to tell what is what. Just like um, uh, you know, my good friend Paulino who says, you know, those you know when people see little girls, it scares me because they're rarely ever little girls. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, this mm. stuff that we see, we don't. You know, it's not necessarily what we see. Um, so, you know, that just to make it even harder, right? I mean, it's hard enough yeah. to try to get insight into this stuff. And, and, uh, and of course, if it's a little girl with wet hair, just run because, you know, <laughs> the, mo <laughs> the movies taught us that's just no good. No, no kidding. Yeah, you, you know, yeah. it, it's funny. Uh, it's funny you say that uh, there was um, a house here in Florida that I used to live in back in 
the 80s when I, we first moved to Florida, and it was haunted. I mean, this was a, your classic haunted house. And my brother, who saw apparitions, I never saw an apparition. I saw things move in the house by themselves, yeah. but I never saw an apparition. My brother actually saw a an apparition of a little girl, and that freaked him out. He doesn't really like talking about it because it freaked him out so badly. Uh, it's funny, funny enough, the house sits... Uh, it's still there, by the way. It's still, you know, it hasn't been torn down or anything. But it sits in an, in an area where there used to be a funeral home right on that ground. Uh, so there used to literally be a funeral home that got remodeled into a duplex home. And you know, the, why is it that children are, are seen as apparitions? I, like, that really baffles me because uh, especially a child, if they die, you would expect them to cross over easily. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't – the best theory that I've heard is uh, the multiverse theory that – Mm. That these are not necessarily spirits of the dead; that the, that instead they're actually uh, living, and through a parallel world intersect um, as uh, a glitch I, in the matrix. Uh, well, there you go. Yeah, we're <laughs> almost like two bubbles intersecting. Where right, uh, you know, now in that moment you can see, which is why sometimes uh, the ghosts are more scared of uh, the family that claims they're being haunted than. Uh, than the people, you know, nobody knows who they both feel they're being haunted, in other words. Right. You know, and, and you see that happening. So um, the multiverse really explains nicely just so much of the paranormal. Uh, now, again, you know, even that is speculative, even though it's become much more scientific in the last few years. I mean, really mm -hmm. scientific, but... Not that, yeah. I, not that I understand it, other than, you know, a lot of <laughs> physicists have problems understanding it. But uh, well, have you seen Interstellar? Because they deal with that subject in that movie. Oh, really? Oh, i got to see yeah, that. Yeah, thing. yeah. You, you have to see it. It's phenomenal. In, in the movie, Matthew McConaughey's character goes to a black hole to try to find a way to go to another solar system that has planets hey, that can harbor life. I want to see that, yeah. Now, in the process, I don't want to ruin it for you, but in the yeah. process, he actually steps into the fifth dimension. And you see the effects that the fifth dimension has on the third dimension, and it looks like it's ghostly activity. Ah, there you go. It's brilliantly written. I mean, the, the writing of this movie is phenomenal. The directing is amazing by Christopher Nolan, and Matthew McConaughey is amazing. You really have to watch the movie. It's, it's just a, a great, great movie. And it, it's funny because you're absolutely right. Science is, in, in a sense, you know, figuring a way... Uh, with, with theories, because obviously we can't prove that there's other dimensions yet, right. but with these theories, there it, it does lead to the possible explanation for apparitions and ghostly activity. Yeah, and and of course, you know, everything we didn't understand was once uh, supernatural, as as they say, right. and uh, and and you know, the best definition of a ghost that I've ever heard was by Mark D'Antonio from MUFON. You may know him. Uh, oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, Mark said a ghost is, you know, I define a ghost as unknown science. And, you know, that once we know, you know, that will be very explainable. Uh, that is a great quote. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, um, you know, that, that really uh, kind of puts it in perspective. But it seems like uh, the idea that there's a here and a there is a very... A simplistic way of uh, uh, it's kind of an obvious way of thinking, you know, back to that whole magic thing. There's here and then there's there, you know, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and if they're still around, then they're lost, right. you know, and we need to help them find their way because they obviously took a wrong turn um, to get there because they're still kind of here, uh, but they're not really here. So they're in between, you know, so we use those terms. And if you think about them, they're very, very simplistic. A very mm. simplistic view where in reality uh you know it's just like our view oh the world's flat well why because well that's what we see that's you know we're standing we we look we said no it's flat as far as i can see <laughs> and you know and then we learn that it's not flat it's round but wait actually it's not really round it's oblong but we'll go with round because most people still say you know what i mean there's only nine planets no wait there's eight well wait maybe we vote the other one back in and yeah, reality all, changes on a constant basis, right? <laughs> and there's all, there's only one galaxy. Oh no, there's many, but there's only one universe. But no, oh, no. Recently, they found thousands of uh, Earth-like planets. Right. So go figure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, we keep. Uh, we've always been historically very bad at, at you know knowing what's around the corner, 
when it comes to, uh, you know, science. And I do feel science and religion are coming together, but they're all using different language. But, mm. uh, but yeah, that always gets me the, you know, um, uh, or, or I like the, uh, the unfinished business. I, I never really bought that. Um, I felt, um, you know, you're done. I'm sorry. You, you know, you're done. Uh, or you're never done. You know, in the multiverse, there, would, there really is, there is no death really, because uh, there's a million of Right. Because I'm selling books in other multiverses. You know. <laughs> hopefully, you're hopefully you're, good you're an author yeah. across the universe, multiverse. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it's funny you mentioned that, though, because, you know, that it has always been kind of a, of a thing that I that bugged me about, it, you know, the the whole apparition uh, theory or ghost or whatever, or, or even poltergeist. Uh, the fact that somebody who would die would choose to not go to the light and stay around here or, or stay in limbo because that would be a choice, right? I mean, if you're at that point where you, you're seeing the light and the light's calling to you, that's what everybody says happens. Why would you not go to the light if that's yeah. what's supposed to happen? You know what I mean? Why would you want to stay around? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah, to me that was always... Um... It bugs me. Yeah, to, to and, and, you, and you need help crossing over? I mean, really? Yeah. And you're such a loser, you can't even do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. You know, um, yeah, I, I, I never liked... I never liked that. Um, and, you know, I think you don't really know where you're sending people. You know, if, you, if you're trying to help, if you're trying to help out a quote unquote spirit, and if they're not really a spirit, then you don't really know where you're sending them to. <laughs> but uh, right. that's true. You know, but yeah, I never bought the, uh, the unfinished business part. Now, of course, part of that, you know, is there's really logical reasons for why people would think that way because we do know, you know, traumatic areas, you know, like Gettysburg and whatnot. Uh, you know, you do see that, that activity or what I would call the parallel world intersects, uh, are more visible in those areas of, uh, you know, big disasters like that. Um, but, you know, the multiverse theory would say that those uh, people who are fighting in the battle uh, are not, you know, spirits of the dead. They're, they're actually fighting the battle, you know. Right. <laughs> so uh, in, in a different uh, dimension, if you will. And, th and that's very hard for us to understand. We, we can't fathom. Uh, it's we, you know, we have the ability to, but it's just very difficult. Uh, just like... Um, uh, it's very difficult for us to imagine that because we think uh, very simply and uh, linear, and we all do. I mean, it's I know that time and space is not the way we experience it, but it's still such a tough concept to grasp. I mean, you know, Einstein knows it, Stephen Hawking knows, all the most brilliant people say, you know, that's it's an illusion, time is not, you know, Time is, we're experiencing it this way. It's not like it's not happening. Right. But, uh, but that's not, it's not what time and space is. And we've known that for so many years, but as reg people walking around, we, we can't fathom that. I don't well, know. You know. Maybe I've Stephen had, Hawkins can, but I can't. Yeah, well, he has a lot of time to do yeah, yeah, exactly. these things, you know. Love Stephen Hawkins. But, you know, it's funny because I, my theory has always been, and I've actually gotten into arguments with people about this, Bill, uh, when it comes to time. I, you know, my thing is, we, you know, mankind made up time. Time is not an existing thing. We made up time to explain why things decay and age, why things die, you know, that, to give us a timeline or or the length of living. And we created that, you know. Yeah, we created it because of the way the sun rotates around the planet, and that's how we gave it time. But right. really, in the cosmic sense of things, uh, time is different everywhere because every planet has a different star system. Every planet, you know, rotates differently. So their time would be different than ours. But in a cosmic sense, uh, a cosmic time would be different than Earth time. So in other words, we created our time. Our time is not real. That's why I don't believe in time travel, for example. I don't think that's possible because how can you go somewhere that doesn't exist? Um, yeah, I think that's a, a fascinating uh, view on it. I, I also think it's fascinating how you and I can experience time so differently. It could be going by slow for you and right. fast for me. So, you know, which gets to the whole perception, uh, you know, viewpoint. Um, although everybody seems to think that time travel is, everybody meaning the, the powers that be, like um, 
uh, you know, or, or well, Einstein for one, but uh, and again, Stephen Hawking, that time travel uh, is possible. Well, yeah, but remember, um, their theory is always that it's possible into the future because you have to go past the speed of light, and if you go that, time slows down for you. And but again, a, a human body won't be able to withstand that kind of a, of acceleration. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we'll find uh, I think we'll find another way. Uh, theoretically, anyhow, I don't know if we'll we'll do it or if we even should do it. And <laughs> that's a different story God. together. Imagine that uh, we'll be able to screw up things like all even over more. again. <laughs> <laughs> the Back to the Future effect. We'll go back in oh. time, nineteen fifty-five, and just yeah. mess everything up. I think we're doing that already, right? I mean, we just keep doing that with uh, with the government. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe we don't need Probably. to go anywhere. Right? <laughs> in an alternate universe, uh, Bush yeah. never won, and nine eleven never happened, but. Yeah. We went back in time, and look what happened. Uh, Messed it up already. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if they found a way to, you know, go into different uh, eras or different time periods, but do it through other dimensional or other uh, that's parallel what, universes. Yeah. That and, and that I can understand because you could travel to another bubble universe and pick a certain place to, to jump into. That maybe I can see as a theory working. Uh, that could possibly be. And in fact, that. Uh, Really, when you look at a movie like, for example, Back to the Future, yeah, they went back in time, but in reality, when they go back into the future, the the timeline split because of what they did, creating an alternate reality. In other words, they never really go back to their original universe. It disappears right, from their perspective. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they're, they're in an alternate universe as it is from that point on. Yeah, and with the multiverse, you know, you can have... Uh, exactly. Yeah, you can have the other worlds that are in different timelines, even though you're not really going back. So I guess it wouldn't really matter. You'd still be able to experience, you know, a different uh, era. So see, we solved everything. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> All in about 40 minutes. It's right. amazing. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> now what constitutes the, given this uh, house, the, the title of the world's most haunted house. I mean, uh, I know you've researched this house and, and from the, uh, the captions back here, uh, painstakingly researched this for years. So uh, what gave this, this house, the, the that title of the world's most haunted house, because that's a, a heck of a title. Yeah, it, it really was uh, meant to embody the uh, the public nature of it, because it was kind of like the Roswell of haunted houses. Ah. So, so it wasn't that okay. You know, no other house was you know haunted as bad, or you know, we well all know there's probably plenty that. You know that you or I don't never heard about that are right. you know horrifying or whatever. Well, but, well we but, count the Amityville house by the way because that has been debunked so many times over the years. But that's in lore, uh, you know, a, a very very uh, scary house. You know, a lot of people believe it is haunted. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that uh, if you believe it happened is was classified as a poltergeist. Actually, which right, is, which is uh, interesting, but. Um, but yeah, due to the public nature of this, that really is what the title was uh, meant to embody. Uh, it actually is a publisher's title; it wasn't my original title. But, uh, uh, but, um, and and I asked the same question you did, and and uh, you know that's what they said. <laughs> but they said we want to embody the fact that this this was the house. I mean, you know, find another house where you know you had. Uh, you know, 12 fire engines and, you know, over 26 police officers and reporters and over 2,000 people outside the house. And the fact that this story literally went around the world. Um, so that's really what uh, what the title is meant to embody is, is there were other things that went public. And, yeah, you can say, okay, well, the Amityville house is popular, but that wasn't popular as an event that was popular as a promotional campaign after the true. event. You know what I mean? Yeah, true. Yeah, true, true. Uh, because nobody knew what was going on when they were there. Uh, right. And, yeah, they never called the police or anything. So, again, we, you know, uh, whether or not you believe it's true doesn't matter. It's, but the point of this was that it was uh, uh, truly unique in, in, in the way that this had this uh, uh, spreading uh, across um, – uh, the world, and you know that started from the fact that there was just so many witnesses. It's really also hard to get a case where you have just this many uh, witnesses. Uh, certainly, you can say, well, "What about the Bell Witch or something?" Yeah, but when you go so far back, of course, it's hard to 
you know, hard to have this kind of detail. And that was the other part of it is you, we had uh, detail and documentation here like uh, you really ever would would see. I mean, you know, the Enfield Poltergeist case was very well done. I'm not saying it wasn't. It's just this is unique because there was just so many witnesses and all of those uh, witnesses on top of it were, uh, it was documented both in the audio interviews as well as the uh, incident uh, sheets that were taken during the, uh, during the investigation. So, uh, so that's really how the title came about. Uh, it was, uh, and that really added a whole sociological aspect uh, to the case because the poor mm-hmm. family suffered inside the house. Uh, the father, Jerry, suffered at work, you know, with ridicule. And then, uh, you know, looking out the window or they couldn't go anywhere, you know, with all these uh, people there, uh, it became just a, a, you know, real circus. That must be a horrible uh, experience to go through. Really must be. And uh, that definitely changed their lives. Uh, no kidding. <laughs> you know? No kidding. Oh, geez. You know, and, I remember, and look, living in a house that's haunted is not fun. I, I, I experienced it as a kid. I can only imagine going through this kind of trauma. Oh, Jesus. We're talking tonight to William J. Hall, the author of the book, The World's Most Haunted House, the true story of the Bridgeport Poltergeist on Lindsley Street. And uh, just a, a great book. I mean, uh, look, I, I read a lot of books, William, because, you know, I do the show and I have to, you know, follow yeah, up with uh, yeah. the guests and know what I'm talking about. And your book was really easy to get into. I mean, you sent me the uh, the PDF version earlier on, the, uh, the digital version, and I started reading it. Uh, but when I got the actual book in my hands, you know, it's different for me. I, I love reading the digital, digital stuff, but I'm still old school. I like getting the actual book and going oh, through the pages too. and, and yeah. reading and reading the thing. And it's a really good read. It really, uh, you know, I breezed right into like the first half of the book. Uh, and then I, I got to the part of the, the scientific investigation. And I wanted to actually lead this part of the show into that. Tell us a little bit about some of the scientific investigation that's taken place at this house over the last few years that you, you researched and put in the book. Well, uh, the, the original investigation happened uh, in late uh on well, December 1974, so after this thing was announced a hoax to get rid of the crowds, um, uh, Boyce Beatty, a parapsychologist, uh, heard about it on the radio, and he contacted uh, uh, the family through the police department because you couldn't call them directly, and um, you know said he thinks he can help them. And he went down with uh, two other fellows from Duke University, and uh, they expected to, you know, the family agreed to it as long as, you know, it wouldn't go public, you know, that it was just private, kept private. And um, they called the police department expecting to get the brush off. They wanted to interview police officers and they expected, you know, to go go pound sand. (laughs) And instead, the inspector said, you know, thank God you called. Uh, You know, how soon could you come here? You know, and uh the uh, one of the officers who actually announced that it was a hoax uh, was the guy, Inspector Clark and Captain Fabrizi. They authorized um, and mandated um, interviews that the police officers cooperate and be interviewed by uh, this team and even set up a special conference room at the Bridgeport Police Department for those interviews to be conducted. So even pulling people off the street. You know, you tell me who you want to interview, you know, I'll make sure they're available. I'll pull them off the street if I have to. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll get them in here so you can get it done to help the family. All I ask, as you know, as the captain said, all I ask is that, you know, let's keep the newspapers out of it and the people, let's keep it hush-hush and, you know, do it in private. And um, and those interviews, about 12 hours total, eight hours of them were on a reel-to-reel done at the Bridgeport Police Department. Uh, that was uh, part of the material for the book, of course. And then there was uh, some more hours uh, from uh, Bridgeport police officers. And then in addition to that, there were uh, numerous uh, firemen, uh, family, reporters, priests, babysitters, um, uh, neighbors, just, um, you know, variety of people interviewed. And then uh, I ended up, uh, re-interviewing uh, some of the folks who were originally interviewed, kind of almost to get a retrospective on it, ones mm-hmm. that were still with us, and uh, then found new witnesses, did another 10 to 15 hours of 
interviews um, mm. with uh, you know new witnesses, which of course the, thanks to social media it was uh, it was kind of like six degrees of Lindley Street because <laughs> uh, this thing was so big it really affected uh, the whole community, you know the, the the whole city. So you know when you have twenty six police, or probably more than twenty six. Yeah, you know, every every time I do a show, the number changes because they find out you know there's some new witness. Um, um, not really with a new story, but you know. Now, when you say a witness, is, is there somebody who somebody who lived in the house, or somebody who was just witnessed? No, no, a like a like a police officer. I'll give you an example. Uh, okay, this was a few months ago. Um, <clears throat> I did a lecture at Sacred Heart, and a lot of old college buddies, because uh, I went to school there, showed up. And uh, you know, one of the guys, one of my fraternity brothers, says, "Oh, I wish her, I knew you were writing the book." My dad was there. I said, really? Uh, he said, oh, yeah, he was there. He saw the girl in the chair and all this stuff. He said, you got to come over for a beer and, you know, talk to him. You know? So, I mean, <laughs> but, you know, just people come out of the woodwork. And sometimes it's, uh, uh, you know, it, somebody who was a neighbor that comes to the lecture and says, oh, yeah, I heard the screams in the house. And, you know, just little bits and pieces, you know, adding texture to the story is, is you know, what you continually come across. And, of course, with social media, you end up, if you – if the person is no longer with us from 74, um, you have, um, you know, children, nephews, sometimes spouses, just, there's so many people connected to it that, um, it, it's, you know, very interesting how much uh, the story was able to be fleshed out, which, you know, I, I was very lucky because I'm constrained by the truth. There's nothing in the book that's, um, uh, you know, made up or even assumed, you know, if I, right. I wasn't able to really verify it, it, it didn't get in there. There's of course, you know, tons of weird rumors that uh, I'm sure never happened because, uh, with all the people that were interviewed on this, if nobody mentioned it, let's face it, it, you know, I'm sure it didn't happen, <laughs> but, uh, and some were just stupid, like, Oh, police officer jumped out the, was so scared. He jumped out the window. Well, if you see the house, you'd have to be an idiot to jump out the window. It'll take you a half hour to get out. It's, you know, the small. <laughs> yeah, you walk out the door in five seconds. Why would you jump out? You know, so you just get you know, right. some, some of that funny, <laughs> funny stuff that uh, that happens. But uh, yeah, so so it was quite extensive. Uh, uh, you know, the investigation then, and then um, what I did in putting it together, and 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 it was. You know, Joe Tomic, who I had interviewed, kept the original police report and he sent it to me. And um, I was very lucky that uh, the investigators read uh, the police reports into, uh, you know, the cassettes because, uh, you know, those reports, you know, you can't get them. Uh, well, I mean, one I got from Joe, which was, you know, because he kept it, you know, Officer mm. Tomic. But, uh, you know, the police department only keeps those records for 10 years, so... You know, <laughs> oh, that's gone, and, yeah. And, yeah, all it's gone. They, and from what I heard, rumor was they got rid of those records uh, even sooner just because, you know, made them look stupid. And, <laughs> you know, and they already announced it as a hoax. And so, you right. know, they th threw a lot of their own guys under the bus, but they understood why. So it's, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by the fact that um, there's so many witnesses to uh, to this thing and they just keep coming forward. Uh, and, and nobody recently uh, has uh, has had any experiences at all in the house. I know that Lady Lizard now has no idea of what's going on, but there hasn't been any more activity in the last 10 years? <clears throat> not that we, you know, not that we know of, uh, according to the neighbor. Uh, nobody said anything around the neighborhood or anything? Um. No, not about uh, not about that particular house. Now, at the time, in, in seventy, well, in researching this, uh, there were other houses that were impacted, as you know, we often find back to our, you know, multiverse discussion and you know things like that. Different kinds of uh, entities, and nothing anywhere as near as severe as Lindley Street, but. Um, you know, once the doors open, so to speak. So there were, uh, I know, at least three other houses on that street that were impacted as a result of the uh, the infestation, if you will, of, you know, Lindley Street. Um, I did not hear or find any evidence of any UFO activity, which, I, <laughs> you know, which I did look for because, you know, now we know. I mean, back then right. we wouldn't even think to look, look, you know, we weren't even looking at other houses, you know. Uh, but today, I think it's important, 
you know, that we look at all those things because we find that sometimes, you know, birds of a feather kind of, you know, sometimes they're, Indeed. you know, yeah, yeah we, that we find that it's much more, um, you know, we can't think in silos like we used to. Now, speaking of UFO activity, uh, I mean, what is your theory or thought on uh, the whole UFO phenomenon? Um, I, you know, I think they're... Do you think it's legit? Do you think most of it's made up? Oh, no, I think it's legit. I, I think, of course, a lot of human sightings are, you know, misinterpretations of regular phenomena. And right. U, UFOs, yes, you know, there's been, you know, fakes, fake photographs and things. You know, we all know, you know, we know that that happens. But, right. uh, it, yeah, it definitely is a legitimate uh, phenomena. And, uh, in fact, I was never one to believe uh, documents in, in books. I would go and uh, uh, even as... You know, back in the '80s when I was reading these books, so I, I would see a document and it would fascinate me, and I would find out. I'd order it from the government. I'd pay twelve bucks and I'd get it in the mail, and I'd compare it to what the book said, and you know, and then I was able to, you know, to know. You know, I was curious, so you know, if I'm discussing it with a friend, they'd say, "Ah, you don't know if it's real," but they'd leave it at that. You know, but people like you and I, and probably everybody listening to this. You know, we were more curious. You know, we'd say, "Well, wait a minute. We right. don't have to. We don't have to wonder about it. I'm going to order the document and see if they send it to me. And if they send it to me and it says what they say in the book, and I believe that this is the proper interpretation, then I know something is. You know, I know there's something to this. Um, so, I, you know, so yeah, I think it's real. I think there's a lot. Uh, obviously, we don't we don't know about it, but, uh, yeah, it definitely, definitely is, uh, is, uh, real. In fact, there's, uh, there's an interesting book. I don't know if it's the 1600s or 1500s, but the original, uh, fairy lore, um, uh, I think it's by, uh, Reverend Kirkland or whatever. It's a very old book. It's not even, it's not marketed as a UFO book. It's marketed as an English literature kind of book. Uh, it's used uh, in in English classes, uh, so you know it's out of really the, the view of the UFO community. But it talks about uh, basically cow mutilations, and it talks mm. about it talks about lights that uh, or, or torches that uh, that uh, have no fire and go on and off at will. You know, sounds like a flashlight, you know, so, right. I mean, there's just a lot of weird, uh, you know, we know there's something there. We don't know what's to it. And I believe the government uh, certainly knows a lot more than they're telling us. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's just, it's, this. that's one of those things that I really wish um, we could know more about because, you know, unlike the, the paranormal where, um you know, it's it's somewhat accessible because, you know, it happens and whatnot. And we can speculate, and there's a lot of stuff we don't know. What what gets me mad is with UFOs, we do know, even if we don't have all right. the answers, which I'm well, sure that, we don't, that there yeah. are some answers that, you know, there is some knowledge out there that we're just not privy to, and that kind of... Well, not only that, it's also <laughs> the fact that they're, they're physical, you know, manifestations, but they're physical yeah. beings, apparently, uh, with physical crafts that are flying around. It's a little bit different than a, a, a spirit being that is just, a, you know, just a, a ghostly activity, something you can't really see or touch or feel. Uh, a, a craft, you could see it, you could physically see if it's there or not, you know, it's, it's a more physical thing. And you can learn uh, from it, ghost right, activity. it stays, right. yeah, it's not like, oh, look, the portal stays, we can go in and out right. <laughs> and explore. <laughs> so, yeah, but that's what gets me mad about that is, you know, there is, there is knowledge um, that, that, you know, I would love to know that we just can't know. Whereas with the paranormal, sure, okay, I'm not saying I can't learn anything else about it, sure, you know, but... It's uh, there's some real answers. I think uh, there, I'm sure there's many more questions, but there's some real answers in the UFO arena, and it's uh, it is uh, unfortunate that we're not uh, you know we're not allowed to know them. I don't believe the mass hysteria thing. I don't think anybody would be you know. I mean, yeah, neither do I. So many people yeah. believe. This. I mean, most people believe that, that that they exist, whether or not we found them anyhow. So you know, even the Vatican has come forward saying they believe in UFOs or aliens. That they believe they're out there, and they the Vatican uh, released a statement saying they believe that aliens would be in God's plans. Uh, so it's not out of the realm of you know God's 
uh, ability to create life. You know, they, if God created the universe, the heavens, the earth, everything, yeah, he created aliens also. They're part of his plan, the divine plan. So I, it, I don't think it'll really Very upset the apple cart. Yeah, I don't think they'll upset the apple cart all that much, really, uh, especially religion. Uh, religion. Look, throughout religious, uh, different religions, uh, the, the terminology of creatures or aliens uh, are in there. If you look at certain religions, you'll, you'll notice certain references to beings that are not of this earth. For example, the Bible has uh, the, Elo- the, uh, the, the, um, the Nephilim. The giants. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, if you just look at that lore alone, I mean, what do you think they're talking about? They're they're the 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 children of the gods that descended to the earth and made it with man's women or with women. Uh, I mean, with earthly women. Uh, what does that tell you right there? They came from the heavens. They came from outer space. They descended to earth. They made it with earthlings. That's pretty much. Uh, they're telling you the aliens came down and mated with humans. That's what it. That's what it's saying. But this yeah. way, it's interpreted as uh, angels or some kind of other activity. But really, it's extraterrestrial. In fact, William, I had this conversation. This is really funny. I had a conversation a while back with a very religious person who's a, a family member, and we were talking about God and the interpretation of what God is and whatnot, and. I said something to this person that literally made him not talk for about a minute and a half and just think of the statement that I made to the point that their rebuttal was like, well, I just think I became an atheist. And (laughs) my my entire uh, comment was that in theory, no matter what way you look at God, God is in theory an extraterrestrial. This person was dumbfounded by that comment. And I said, said, well, what is God? Is God of this earth? Whatever, whether it's a man, female, being, whatever it is, is it of this earth? No, it doesn't live on earth, right? It lives off of earth. What, where do aliens live? Off of earth, right? So what's the difference? They're both extraterrestrial in their own different forms. One might be aliens on another planet. One might be a godly being in another dimension, but they're still extraterrestrial. They're not of this terrestrial earth. So in hence, and, and by the mere definition, God is an ET. Oh, and literally. Bad. This person looked at me with his face like, like if I was possessed by the devil. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of those things. Yeah. Well, you know, but the, I, yeah, but how uh, how off am I though? Honestly. Yeah. Right. Um, well, and just like the all knowing thing um, gets me because we're not all knowing, so we don't even right. we don't even know what all knowing is. So, uh, what you really mean is knowing more than you. Oh no, no, all knowing. Yeah, but you don't know what that is. You, you know, you can't, uh, how could you make that judgment? It's like if you open the hood of a car and say, you know, Bill, is this car put together perfectly? And, I don't know. I don't know anything about cars. What, am I, what can I tell you? you know, <laughs> how could you possibly say that so, something is all-knowing or all-powerful if you don't know what all-powerful looks like or all-knowing looks like? You can only say more powerful and more knowing than me or anybody I know. <laughs> you know, um, right. and, you know, and that's okay. You know, that's okay if that's what you believe. But I mean, to say, oh, no, 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 it's all, how, you know, but yeah, but you don't know that. You can't proclaim it because you have no concept of it. You know, you, right. you, just, you just can't do it. Oh, no, it, it's very true. In fact, Michio Kaku has a great way to, uh, to reference uh, what aliens would be compared to us and his references what we would look like to a pile of ants in the backyard uh you know if we go to the backyard and try to interact with the ants they will have no you know, acknowledgement that we're even there other than if we're stomping on them to run away because they're they're being killed but other than that you know we're foreign completely to them we're alien to them we're a higher intelligence to them we are like gods because you know we could wipe them out immediately that's a godly thing, uh, but that doesn't mean that we're the god. In other words, aliens right. to us might look at us like if we're the ants. In other words, they're not gods, but to us they're much more superior because of their evolution, because they're much be, much, might be much older or more technologically advanced or whatever it is. Uh, but they might look as look at us like we were the ants. Right. Yeah. Mind-boggling, Michio Kaku. By the way. Great guy. Uh, it, it's crazy, though, when you start thinking about the the fact that, and it's, you said it earlier, it makes perfect sense. It is all kind of intertwined, isn't it? It's all, like, interconnected. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, and that that's why I think, um, you know, saying that these are spirits of the dead or these are demons, I mean, they're all, I think, you know, primitive words that we use. Um 
you know, for something that's far more complex. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, science is in the last few years really getting a handle on how this uh, would work. But it's right. you know, it's a tough it's a tough concept for us. If you have a pile of papers and you know you take one off and you have less papers, that makes sense to us. But if you have one sheet of paper and you take it off and you have another sheet of paper in its place, we don't get that. <laughs> you know, but that's that's the multiverse. You know, so yeah. it's a very difficult uh, concept uh, for us to get. But that's where you know the argument. You know, uh, you know, could aliens be from the future? Yes, or um, or maybe not at all, because if you're from a different multiverse, it doesn't mean they've been around for longer than us. It simply means they're different on a different planet, a different existence, different, you know, bubble and so on, you know? So, um, yeah, I suppose it doesn't really matter because, you know, the results the same, but, uh, uh, you know, but it, it could be any, any number of those things. Yeah, or, I mean, and and with the multiverse, there could be different ones, of course. You know, one question I've always had about the multiverse, multiverse, uh, multiverse theory, uh, especially if it's a bubble universes, uh, if they are colliding with each other, wouldn't that like destroy the bubble universes? I mean, if they're colliding to the point that we're getting these uh, glitches in the matrix, no, wouldn't we no. see more of a ramification from these collisions or these interactions. No, because with with string theory, um, it all is. Um, I mean, it's all. Ex it really, the the bubble is more what we what we see and experience. But the multiverse is um, everywhere. You know, according to string theory, and it's always shifting. It's always you know the energy is always. Uh, is always going on. It's not like it's it stopped. So. The bubble or the intersect is, is really our ability to kind of see it um, versus, you know, whether or not it's there, I guess, is the best way to explain it without being a <laughs> physicist and able, able to do any better. Although maybe we'd both be confused if a physicist explained it. But yeah, um, no kidding. That's, kind of, that's kind of how I, I probably didn't get it perfect, but that's how it was explained to me by a physicist is that. Uh, you know, that it's more of our glimpse into that world, not the fact that, uh, uh, you know, that that world doesn't exist and now all of a sudden it's colliding with us. It's more like we're able to see it. And there are, and I believe ramifications would be uh, the energy. So, hmm. you know, again, not, you know, like in Lindley Street, it would be the refrigerator floating or uh, feeling nauseous because, you know, we're not used to that kind of, intertwined uh, energy. So there are some ramifications that way, but not, you know, not in, uh, you know, any, you know, grand scheme way, just more. So universes are not going to explode by right, you know, right. hitting each right. other. <laughs> right. No, that, that, yeah, because the idea is it's our experience that is limited. The multiverse is, is there. It's not like the multiverse is crashing or anything. It's just our ability to, experience it is is what the difference is not whether it exists because it's there all the time anyhow do you think there ever uh will will be a point in science where we'll be able to prove uh the multiverse do you think will, will there be a scientific uh method that will prove it once and for all uh i believe so and it, and it could be it could be as soon as a year or, you know, it could be hundreds of years. No. <laughs> you know, the way this stuff is a very fine line, but you know, with the advancements that were made, even just in the last, you know, two years. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm much more positive of that than, you know, the time travel or any of the other stuff. Um, <laughs> I just, yeah, you know, I, I agree yeah. I mean, we got a lot of ideas and theories about mm. the other stuff. I think with the, uh, with the uh, multiverse, uh, you know, string theory, you know, the quantum, quantum physics, I think uh, those things are, I think we're much closer at uh, proving. But then again, their, you know, prove is, of course, you know, people will question that because I think there's, there's a lot of theory in it. But, uh, you know, we already know there's certain particles that don't exist unless they're observed. So it, it kind of takes the whole everything begins at matter thing. Uh, and destroys our kind of basic and isolated um, 
you know, scientific method that, you know, that matter is where it starts. We're really, uh, you know, they're saying it's consciousness is where it starts. Hmm. So fascinating. I don't pretend to understand, uh, you know, all of it or how it works. <laughs> And that's a good. That's a that's a really interesting concept, though. That consciousness is where everything starts. It's not even matter. Matter comes after the consciousness, uh, which again goes back into what you know. What are we after we die? Well, we continue as consciousness, and that's our soul or our spirit being. Um, do, you, do 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 you believe though that once we die, there is a, a spirit uh, that ascends to the other side? Do you think that we are a spiritual being? Um, I hope. At so. the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I. Um... You know, if the multiverse is, is correct, then we never truly die. Hmm. And um, and that ties in, I think, with everybody's, not everybody's belief, because I mean, atheists would, <laughs> wouldn't fit in. But, you know, whether you believe in reincarnation, you know, the multiverse would fit where that comes from. Um, the same thing with, you know, ascension or going to another side or that kind of thing. The, the multiverse basically would be you know, you're, you're always existing and it would kind of be that energy, uh, difference, but they're all such, they're all difficult concepts, but I, I'm certainly hopeful that that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, what it's about. Cause I, I, you know, I want to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? <laughs> well, you know what, if I had the option for reincarnation, I don't know if I would take it to be honest with you, the way things are going on this planet, it's not looking good. <laughs> yeah, but think how much you'll know. Yeah, but, oh, that's that, true. but you don't remember anything, right? It. Yeah, right. I mean, what's the yeah. what's the point of that? Unless you're David Wilcox, and then you'll remember everything that happened in your past life. Exactly. He's he's one of the few. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, what do you what are your theories on on people that say that they've been reincarnated like he does, and and you know give these great tales of who they were? Um, I. That, uh, you know, that's that's been explained to me that, that that actually could be tied into the multiverse also. Um, I think we experience it as um, as these uh, things, almost, you know, well, like memories. Um, but there, there actually is a case I'm working out now that's the subject of uh, my second book coming out in August, uh, Haunted House Diaries, which... Um, there was a, an interesting uh, occurrence about um, uh, one of the children in the house that um, talked about, uh, you know, before it was your baby, I was, you know, just all of a sudden came out with this stuff, uh, which is just completely bizarre, you know, for, for a child to, to be sane and, you know, what they said and whatever. I don't want to elaborate on that now because it's a long, longer story, but, um, but so we do see a lot of these very convincing things. Uh, but then the question is what actually happened? Hmm. Um, you know, is it reincarnation or is it some sort of memory thing or is it tied to the multiverse? Because, you know, the multiverse, um, theorists would say, well, that's, uh, that's simply a, um, a, um, almost like uh, we see paranormal activity when we have these parallel world intersects. You know, that could be a almost like a parallel memory intersect, <laughs> for lack of better terms, that these are memories from uh, you being in a different multiverse. But, you know, I don't know. It's a lot of speculation, no matter what the, <laughs> the answer is. But I think there's something to it. I don't think everybody is lying that has that kind of experience. The question is, what is the experience? Of course, the $6 million question. So, um, but you know, I, I do believe it's more than, Oh, they're just making it up or it's just a stupid memory. That's not real. I believe there is definitely something, um, uh, certainly not in all cases, but in, you know, many of these cases, there's something going on there. Definitely. You know, I wasn't a, a big believer in reincarnation until a couple of years ago, or, I, or a year and a half ago, actually, uh, where I saw, a, I can't remember the name of the child, but it was a kid who, uh, at a very early age, started uh, having uh, 
memories and dreams of a past life in a little island in a little house and it was somewhere that he had never been to or even seen on tv and he described the place and location to his parents to a t they went and found the remote island where he was dreaming about and they found the house and everything that he had uh, in, in his visions and he gave names and everything of the people who lived there talked about the dog at the house uh, i mean the details were very yeah, really bizarre yeah. I mean, that made me a believer uh, that there could be something to the reincarnation thing. Uh, even if it's not a manifestation of an actual person coming back from the dead uh, per se, but uh, maybe a memory that gets stored somehow within the bloodline or, or yes. maybe something, yeah. you know, that could possibly be you know happen. And the reason I say in the bloodline or within the family genes is because uh, as uh, anybody who's an amputee or somebody who's had a limb uh, transplant would attest to, uh, there is a phantom limb syndrome where people either have the feeling of a limb that's still there when it's not anymore, or they've had an implant uh, put on them from another uh, from another donor. Uh, they would have memories from that donor. You know, certain things, certain traits would carry over, uh, which it's bizarre. I mean, people have uh, have had uh, they've had, for example, heart transplants or different organs transplanted, and all of a sudden now they can play the piano or they could speak other languages, which they never could speak before. And then they would find out that the person who donated the organ was the person who, who played piano or spoke different. I mean, that's happened numerous times in the past. Uh, and so it, it could be that maybe the, these memories are in our genes and not so much in our mind, because what is the mind really, if not just a large spongy hard drive? I mean, it right, doesn't right. mean it doesn't mean that's holding the actual information that could be within the DNA itself carried over. Uh, towards you know different genes and and the, down the family line, that's always been kind of my theory on you know uh, on what reincarnation really is. Uh, somebody just tapping into information that it's stored within the actual bloodline. Right, right, almost like the collective unconscious. Right, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of. Right, just a little bit more advanced or fleshed out, but uh, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I mean, and you know, there are those cases, you know, describing people you never met and. Uh, and then you find a picture of it, and no, you know, he never met great grandma. And, you know, how is he describing her as if he knows her? You know, right, right. Yeah, fascinating stuff. I mean, this also explains, for example, when uh, kids lose their parents at a very, very early age, and they never grew up with that parent, but yet they inherit some of the attributes or some of the mannerisms or quirkiness of that parent. Um, you know, that's happened. I, I had a friend who lost his father when he was like four, uh, but his parent or his mother. Uh, would say that he acts just like his dad in many different areas and, and does a lot of the same kind of things uh, that his dad would do before he passed away. Uh, just, you know, different mannerisms and, and quirks that he has. And that seems to be something he just inherited through the bloodline almost because, I mean, why else would he have the same kind of tics or quirks as his father who he's never really met? Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, that, that's actually a true story. I actually know somebody whose dad passed away in this you know, this actually came. Yeah, especially once. if they were. I'm, I'm gathering there are very, very specific things too. Yeah, you know, like uh, twitches. Yeah, yeah, certain twitches with the eyebrows. I mean, certain things that he does physically, physical twitches. I'm talking about. Uh, right. and certain yeah. things, characteristics. He likes playing the guitar. His dad was a guitar player, and he never knew his father. Like he never met. You know, he, he was four when his dad passed away. So right, technically, right. you know, you don't really know your parents. No, you don't remember any. Yeah. Not yeah, consciously, so I mean, anyway. Yeah. And in the house, nobody ever said, "Oh, you know, your dad played guitar." It wasn't that, that wasn't a conversation? You know, that came right. up after the fact that he picked up the guitar and he started, you know, playing guitar. And it was funny because he, it was almost like he inherently knew how to play the guitar. It was like they, it just came to him easily, like it was inherently there. You know, like he inherited the, the talent or the gift or the skill almost. Uh, uh -huh. it just it, it, it's an amazing thing. Uh, it, listen, we're almost out of time here, and I know you have another book coming out. Uh, when we when you, that book is out, I want to have you back on because you're you know, you've been oh, a great, great. guest. I oh, uh, love having you on. It's been fantastic. Also, I want to give you a chance to give your website address to everybody listening in, uh, so they can follow your work. Get the book. I'm gonna. By the way, I'm posting the book link on my website, thejackholesaid.com. So anybody who's listening in right now, could go directly there and they could click right on the link, go to Amazon, buy the book. Uh, but give everybody your website address so they can follow your work also. Oh, yes, uh, William J. Hall Author com, And that has everything, information on uh, the books, um, some free things for listeners, and hopefully you have fun there. Also, you know, my Facebook page link and Twitter, so uh, you can get everywhere from there. So William, cool. William J. Hall com. I mean, William J. Hall Author com. Sorry. There you go. You forgot the author part. <laughs> yeah. 
It's a, it, I'm telling you, it's a, it's a really good book. I, I, you know, I'm glad you, I finally got a copy of it. I'm going to go over it a couple times because uh, it, it's uh, really, really interesting stuff. And I'm into the subject of uh, you know the, the ghostly activity, poltergeist, all that stuff. Uh, it's always been fascinating to me, even though I don't fully uh, register with the belief of the afterlife. Uh, it is an interesting subject because I do think there's something there that is very, very, very bizarre and interesting. Uh, are you going to see the, the poltergeist uh, remake, by the way? Oh, well, I didn't know there was one. Now that I know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> really, you hadn't heard the, the remake? No. They, they've remade it. Yeah, it's uh, coming out this year. Uh, it looks really creepy. In fact, when we get off the air, I'm going to send you the link for, for the trailer. Oh, awesome. Yeah, no, it's probably probably really good. It looks really good. Sam Rockwell plays the father in this thing. Oh, wow. Great yeah, actor. I, I, I definitely want to check it out. Yeah, that'll be fun. That's, that's going to be really, really good. Uh, William, thank you so much for being here one more time. Take care of yourself, and uh, we'll have you on on Future Theater pretty soon. Bill and Nancy says hi. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Tell them I say hi, too. <laughs> thanks so much for being here, William. Talk All to you right, soon. Thanks. Bye. There you go, everybody. That is the great William Hall. And, uh, again, the book, uh, The World's Most Haunted House. Highly recommend it. It's a great book. Uh, I'm going to read the entire – I'm already, like, halfway through the thing. I'm, I'm going to look at my bookmark here. I'm on page – 152 on the book, and it's a total of, I'll tell you right now, it's about uh, 245 pages, 143 pages, so I'm almost done with the book, I'm going to go over it a couple times, I'm going to do a little uh, video review type of thing for YouTube also, uh, linked to thejackalshead.com, and uh, I'm going to post that on pretty soon, uh, great book, please check it out, uh, check out his website also, uh, williamjhallauthor.com, and uh, guys, uh, this has been a lot of fun, we're going to be back next week, right here on Inside the Jackal's Head on Tuesday night. Once again, new time following the Zod Rider show. I love it. The best two, the, the best uh, back-to-back shows on the network, I think. Zod Rider show and Inside the Jackal's Head. Can't beat that. Till next time, everybody, stay classy. This is me signing off for the night. Good night, everybody.